Americans used to think that climate change was something that might be happening elsewhere, and in any case, not to them. But as supposedly rare and extreme weather events become more common, that perception is changing. It is chaos along the Jersey Shore. The superstorm battering the barrier islands. For Americans who make their living directly from what the environment provides, such as farmers and fishermen, the changing climate is not an abstract or theoretical concern, but one very material to their livelihoods. They want to know. They want to not be blindsided by dramatic change. To understand how a changing climate might affect fisheries, in 2011, a group of leading West Coast fishermen, managers, and scientists participated in a workshop in Seattle to explore this issue. So how are such folks thinking about climate change and fisheries now? The initial glance was, okay, temperature change, currents change, uh, shifts in, in, in where, where the animals may be. We had some experiences that, that, uh, that were alarming to, to observers like myself, so, such as the, the huge influx of Humboldt squid from Mexican waters and, uh, you know, animals that are so fast growing, they, you know, they're, it's almost like science fiction the way they, they w would eat almost anything. And we had them here for a couple of years. Interesting, haven't had them the last, the last couple. I think the most important thing in the perception of fishermen is that our consciousness has changed where we know better than to to expect an easily identifiable pattern in climate and weather. We know that that's all out the window and it's going to be new. Other fishermen say that climate change is just one factor affecting their work. Normally they don't talk much about climate change because it's it's not in the forefront of what's affecting their daily lives. You know, there's a lot of other problems. You know, ocean energy facilities and where they're located are a lot bigger problem to them than ocean acidification. Climate change is, is something they just have to learn to live with one way or the other. Decisions made by fishery regulators have drastically reduced the fleet already, this longtime leader argues. At one time, in this port alone, there were 300, over 300 commercial boats. That included charter and salmon troll boats, mostly for the most part. That today has been reduced to less than 75. So when you talk about regulation and impacts on a community, climate change, you know, it has an impact, but it's probably not the dominant impact that we face. Historically, fishermen have prospered by being highly adaptable, say those in the industry. People in, in my industry uh, are in general real adaptable people. We know, we know how to change our gear, change our boats, uh, change our behaviors to accommodate new information. Uh, maybe even more importantly, we know how to, many fishermen are, are capable of making a shift in attitude. I think one of the best strategies that we employ is just maintaining a diversity of different kinds of boats in our fleet, different sizes of boats in our fleet, different management kinds of tools. So I just like to think about um, a diversified portfolio. And I think that's been a good strategy for me at Local Ocean, just in dealing with some of the um, changes and uncertainties over the last 10 years. And I know that fishermen use that strategy too. Uh, my father's boat, like many of the smaller boats, didn't specialize in just one thing. If it was a particularly poor tuna year, then you executed for salmon. If it was a particularly poor um, salmon year, you hoped that you had a, a better shot at crab in the winter. And those kinds of strategies, I think, are smart on all scales. Almost everybody that I know has at one time in their life relied on salmon for an income. A lot of them have moved to Bristol Bay to fish their salmon. This community has a lot of people go to Bristol Bay. But diversifying and adapting may be more of a challenge in the future. To add a Dungeness crab summit, uh, when, when it was asked what sort of research might we be doing, I, I, I brought up uh, concern for acidification and 
that we, you know, we, it's, it's time to quantify and, and develop scenarios for, for changing pH uh, and how that will affect crab, you know, particularly the larval stage, but, but all stages. I mean, it's my impression with other, other fishermen uh, that that's kind of be become bubbled to the top. But more so than, than simple temperature change and shifting populations, uh, there, there could be a shadow over us that, that we're unable to, to do much about you know, through climate change. And uh, we're, we're always used to accommodating risk, but uh, this, uh, this change could be, could be a, a, a huge. The ocean is becoming more acidic as carbon from the atmosphere dissolves in it. Ocean animals that make shells, like crabs and oysters, will have that ability increasingly compromised. That future is now for the hatcheries that raise Pacific Northwest oysters. The attention that's being applied to climate change and ocean acidification has gotten more and more intense. Uh, and that, because we've had some big problems, especially with oyster hatcheries and uh, oyster recruitment in Oregon and Washington. And that's received a lot of attention because it's been economically uh, some devastating in some years for the oyster growers um, in the Northwest. And that's a big industry still. This is a real deal. This is not, you know, I know there's debate about global warming. There's no debate about ocean acidification. If there's CO more CO2 in the atmosphere than there is in the ocean, it will make the ocean more acidic and it will put us out of business. The problem for us is that our larvae form shells, right? And the type of shell they form um, is pretty, uh, the larvae, of course, just like any animal, are very sensitive. And the type of shell that they form is very easy to dissolve, even in normal waters. It's kind of, we're kind of on the edge here in the Pacific Northwest. But now that we've shifted things down just a little bit, what we perceive to be a little bit, we're having a big problem, particularly in our production of small larvae in the hatchery. The Whiskey Creek hatchery operators are making some adjustments to try to counteract more acidic ocean waters. But they've been concerned and are telling others their story. The one thing that uh, weighs heavy on us is, you know, the future, you know, particularly for the young people. This is a serious issue. I can't tell you how important this is. I mean, it's not it's not just important to our our livelihood and, and what we try to do, but we're talking about uh, this is a global issue. Whatever timeline you heard for when ocean acidification will affect the coastal oceans, and, and in particular the Pacific Northwest, and, I, and it's not 2050, it's not the year 2100. It's, it's already happened. My biggest question with um, climate change and and fisheries along our coast is really around the future of, of upwelling and what happens with our winds. That without any changes, we would expect things to gradually warm up and the ocean become sort of warmer on top than it is at depth, which would tend to make it more stratified, like having oil on top of water, which would inhibit the ability to get the cold, nutrient-rich water from the deep ocean into the sunlit part of the upper ocean where most of the life is concentrated. So that would slow down our food web. It would probably change the ranges for lots of fish that are very mobile. It would probably make it less productive for Pacific salmon and more attractive for things like albacore, Humboldt squid, sort of other big predators that are very mobile. And it might change the whole distribution of uh, zooplankton that are out there that are important creatures near the base of the food web. But the recent history in the Northeast Pacific suggests that the wind patterns may be stable within a year for weeks or even whole seasons, but variable from one year to another. Between years, there could be dramatic differences in the effects on fisheries, says this scientist. Some of those changes we might look at and think, hey, this is pretty good. We like this condition, but that condition won't stick around forever. The challenges that are likely to exist with a warming world and one where the CO2 concentration continues to rise at these dramatic rates, then the options for trying to do business the way we've done it in the past get smaller and smaller. And you just have this picture that things are going to be a lot tougher. There's going to be a lot of bad years mixed in with a few good years instead of the situation I think we've had more recently, which is a few bad years mixed in with normal or good years. 
uh, to where people can still make a living doing it. This perspective, that the future is likely to be quite different and not easily adapted to, has the attention of both managers and the industry. I would say e even internally within our agency, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, within the last decade, you've seen a pretty dramatic shift in it, climate change being talked about and then how it's going to affect our management of the resources. And we need to be getting on the ball now in anticipation that our, our knowledge base is changing. I think that there's somewhat of a feeling of helplessness about the about this issue because it seems so much bigger than what we do individually. It's easier to point a finger at point source pollution or if there's a particularly poorly managed fishery that may be overfishing somewhere. Um, easier to say we, we're just going to stop that. We're going to shut off that valve or we're not going to do that anymore. And I think most of us look at this and go, this is so out of our control. We're on a path to a climate that doesn't look like it's going to stabilize anytime soon, not in any of our lifetimes, that this is uh, for the century and in the century after that for it to play out. And whether or not um, collectively humanity can mount some kind of reasonable solutions or defense against climate change and ocean acidification is, is you know, that's an open question. That's a, a big question mark for humanity. This is, this, is a, this is a big change. This is not a bad season. This is not, not uh, a storm that wipes out most of your crab gear or, or a breakdown. This is, this is, a, this is a, a big picture change that we just have to have our eyes open and our minds open and, uh, and use our ability to adapt as, as best we can, even, even with the knowledge that it, in, in some ways, may be bigger than that ability. We need to link more closely than ever with the, the scientific community and we have contributions to make, you know, some of them in terms of our experience to date, but more important in our experience going forward. And, and we, we need to help serve one another uh, to, to best adapt. We can't do it on our own.